This song we sing about grace, that for us as Christians is, that's, what, that's why we are Christians. That's why we're redeemed, is because we, we have grace. It's God's grace that found us. Someone told me a little while ago, he says, you know what? I wish churches would just preach on not what we do wrong, but more on what we do right. So I said, what do you mean? So I said, he says, the Bible's just too full of rules. It's just got too much. Oh, you mustn't do this, but you must do that. So I said, I still don't know what you mean. Give me an example of something. So he couldn't answer me. He says, I'll give you an example. This is a true story. I'm not going to mention names. I didn't mention the name to him. So I said, okay, fine. Let's just say, for instance, the Bible's just got too many rules. Where do our morals come from then? Do we agree with the atheist that the morals are social behavior do we learn morals from our parents do we do does society teach us morals is it tradition that teaches us morals because i want to tell you as i had a conversation even with my brother i said let's take morals on society let's just say our society teaches us no you can't steal that's moral but what about in the countries and in societies where rape is moral. It's moral. Who are we then to say that they are immoral? If morals themselves, that which is right and wrong, is based on human intellect. And I will just form a, form a government. We'll have five people and those five people say, no, this is wrong, that's right. This is right, you mustn't do that. But you can have the very same five people in a different place say, no, 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 it's fine. Rape is fine. Who, are, uh, who am I to tell that person rape is wrong then? If that is their morals based on... Are you following me? On society? Are you following me so far? If society... If a bunch of us get together and say, well, let's decide on what is right and wrong on a human level. Just for the sake of tolerance in society. So we're going to say, we're not going to break into a house, that's bad. But in, society, in some society, they will go into your house, take the stuff. That's because it's communal, so nothing belongs to you, whatever I want. Who am I to tell you that I want to So I answered this person's question, now away from what Jack and I discussed. This I answered this question, I said, okay, fine. I'll give you a real genuine life thing that happened. I know this to be true. I said, I know the family where the one sister wanted to get pregnant, but she did not want a husband just wanted to have a baby. So she started dating. And he that she liked him. And he got her pregnant. And as soon as she got pregnant, she dumped him. And then nine months later, later she had the baby. So this person in question I had spoken to. Now that's what I'm telling this person. The real life story. So this person, I went down and I said, now surely that's wrong. No, 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 no. God blessed me with this baby. So how do you reckon with that? That God blessed you with a baby after you had gone and used another man. So I posed this question to this person. I said, what do you think? What do you think? Let's take the Bible. Let's leave the Bible out. I just want on an intellectual moral standard. What do you think? No, that's wrong. Why do you say it's wrong? Well, it's wrong on many levels get selfishness does that woman know that that man's DNA is in that baby and that, that is the life of father I didn't tell you that in this conversation who told you that it must have been God I said thank you very much God decides morals God's standards make our and control our morals not society because as we stand here right now, there are societies out there whose morals you would vomit at. But who are we to tell them on a humanistic level that they are wrong? So therefore we, as Christians, say that grace finds us. And it reforms us. And it conforms us. So therefore the law that was written, as the Bible says, is now written on our hearts. So that you and I would know immediately what is right and wrong although sometimes we go ahead and do the wrong we go back and say man that was wrong 
Who told you that? Who told you that? It was God. And His laws written on your hearts. No society, no codessa, no governing body would be able to set forth morals for you. Because who's to say they are right? Now that had actually nothing to do with this morning. I just thought I'll share that with you. But what has got everything to do with this morning is the reason for your faith. We've been talking on the book of Colossians chapter 1 for nine weeks now. This is week 10. And I think there were only two weeks we kind of added some practicality to it. All the other seven weeks were just theology. Straight theology, theology, theology. That's all it was. And some of it very deep theology and some of it so deep that I know, what are you talking about? But today, I want to take that theology of everything that we've read about so far in Colossians and I want to bring it into an application of our Christian living. How, and this is just one example, we could be reading Ephesians. We could be reading the book of Hebrews, we could be reading the book of John, we could be reading the book of Thessalonians. Any book, we could be reading the book of Jonah or whatever. Or rather, Judges. How do we take the Bible, use that deep theology of what the Bible says, and put it into practical Christian living? So that it's not just theology, but it goes from the head and into the heart and works out through the human body, the human soul, the human heart. So everything that we've learned, I want to try and see if we can try and put it into practice, at least in part, in what it means to be a Christian. That's the title of my sermon this morning. And where's my glasses? So, come in. Welcome. So that's why I say we're going to move away from theology. I'm going to touch slightly. By the way, I'm not going to mention anything from last week because it's just too much for me to, to mention and we'll be sitting. In fact, I went six minutes over time last week. Um, forgive me if I go 50 minutes over time this week. Okay? But I have to say this. I'm not going to repeat it. But there's one thing I have to repeat because if I don't repeat this, um, I don't think you'll, you'll be able to see the transition between what we spoke about last week into why I am speaking about this. And so the application is from Colossians 1, verse 18 only, and then 21 to 23, and also 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, verse 21 to 23, and then verse 27. And again, I'm reading out the ESV. I've put in my own parenthesis those little brackets in case there's a word you don't understand. I will tell you what it means. In this case, it's pretty simple. Colossians 1, verse 18 says, And He, who is He? Jesus. Is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. Preeminent means superior, above all, above everything. In our vernacular, in our colloquialism, He's the boss. And verse 21, And you, you, all of you were once alienated and hostile. Another word for that is you were enemies in mind and you were doing evil deeds. That's what you were doing. And as the song goes, but grace found you. He, Jesus, read with me on from verse 27, is now reconciled, brought together in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you, all of you, holy and blameless and above reproach before him we'll get to the meanings of that just now if indeed if indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven of which I Paul became a minister verse 27 you know this all too well to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of the mystery which is Christ 
in you the hope of glory. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, our Father, our sole objective, the one in, in whom we give our worship to, the one we pledge our allegiance to, the one whom we give our lives to, the one whom we walk this road for, Lord Jesus. Come and settle our hearts and our minds. Lord, I pray one thing, and I need to say this, that your word that I speak this morning, stop everything in me that would come across in a judgmental way. I ask you that. But bring everything from your grace and your love and your admonishing spirit that we would learn from you. Even be convicted but not condemned. So guard my mouth, I pray, Lord Jesus. But guard the hearts of these people. And Father, I pray that you would cause a, a fertility this morning, a fertile soil within their hearts. That as we look at the practic practicality, practicality of our Christian faith, that we would understand why, in fact, we call ourselves Christians. So I pray, bless the service. Let your words be true in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. So in light of the scripture this morning, what is the reason for your faith? I want to ask this question, which by the way, is, as I said, is the title of my sermon. What is the reason? I want, to, I want you to think about this. What is the reason you call yourself a Christian? And we're going to think about that. We're going to think about that through what the Bible has to say, but we're going to think about that in a practical way, as us as human beings. What is the reason you all, me included, call ourselves Christians? That is the topic, and we're going to break that down. So Colossians 1, the theology of Colossians 1, 18, 21 to 23 is is to help us apply that which we have just read. It's help us to, to apply to our Christianity, our Christian faith, and our Christian lives a practical way of living it out. So in other words, I want all of us seated here this morning and the preacher right here to use what we have been reading for nine weeks now nine weeks in the first book of Colossians and what we've been taught from Sunday to Sunday for nine weeks especially what we have read this morning from verse 18 21 and 23 and allow God's Word that was my prayer and I want you to receive this I want to allow God's Word to be applied to you this morning in a practical way that there's no high theology terms I'm going to use this morning but I'm going to speak plain English that you might walk away and know why you are a Christian that is the goal therefore in order for me to do that we are we are in Colossians there's a, a place I need to turn to Julian it's the first book of Peter chapter 3 I need us to turn there and I'm going to use it as a premise for backing up Colossians but as a foundation so that I can speak to you about the practicality and the application of your Christianity to your life at your workplace or wherever you find, may find yourself to be. First Peter 3 verse 15 says this, but, and that but is there, there's an ellipsis because if you read from verse um, 14 it says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake you will be blessed, have no fear for them nor be troubled so I'll take it from verse 15 ellipsis dot 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 but in your hearts listen to this but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always listen now always being prepared that is a present continuous thing it's not sometimes it's not when you feel good but this 
word is imperative. It's important for us as Christians to always, at any given moment, whether you are down, whether you are happy, in whatever place you find yourself in and at that moment, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks, to anyone who asks, for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Let me break it down. But, honor God in your heart as holy. That's primarily the truth. That is who we are honoring. Our worship is devoted to God. And if that devotion is devoted to God, God, if, if that is true in our hearts, therefore we need to be prepared at any time to tell anyone who asks us, what is the reason that you call yourself a Christian? The Bible uses defense over here. And I'm going to tell you why it uses defense at a later stage. We are called at any given time to anyone that asks, my brother, who come is jy a Christian? Vel, ek gaan kerk toe. Dis nie die antwoord nie. By the way, give them a defense of this one who we say we honor and call God Yahweh holy. That's the defense. So I said, I'm not going to repeat last week's sermon except for this one thing. And that was verse 18. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, that in him everything might be preeminent, superior, and he is above everything else. So if I take Colossians 1.18, and I want to bring that into this morning's sermon, we have to say, and I have to repeat this, and I cannot move away from the pulpit this morning, sorry. Primarily, even though this is true, listen to me family, Paul is not saying that Christ is the CEO of a company. Christ, Paul is not saying that Jesus Christ is the principle of a governing body, although that is true in itself. Christ is the principle. But what he is in fact, in fact saying is if Christ is preeminent and being the head of the body, that means, as I told the church last week, any person here would know it, and sometimes we have even seen it on YouTube. If you decapitate a head off a body, it, does that body still live? No, that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying he is the head. He is the brain. He is the life giver. He is the source of the church. Yes, he is the CEO. Yes, he is the Lord of Lords. Yes, he is the Alpha and the Omega. Yes, he is the beginning and the end. Yes, under him, everything. He is above all things. We know that. He is sovereign, sovereign, CEO. But the point is, without Him being the head of you, 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 this church is dead. You might as well run like, around like chickens with no heads. That's what Paul is saying here. We've got to catch that. Because if we go to the book of Corinthians, he will explain to you why Paul and why Christ is the head of the church. Because the book of Corinthians tells us, 12, from verse 12 onwards, tells us that each and every single one of you are a member of the body. The arm doesn't say to the ah, I don't, I'm not as important as you. Why am I an arm? The body needs the arm. And it goes on and on to describe all the ministries which we say, oh, well, Paul is talking about ministries. Yes, but we have to take it in context that all those ministries are useless without the corp. The arm will die. The feet will die. So he is the life giver to whatever you are doing here this morning, to whatever you are doing at work, to whatever you are doing wherever you are going, to whatever you are doing, where you went, Glynis and Ken, and you guys to Pretoria, wherever you're going, He is the head, and if He is the head of the body, He is going with you. He is your life giver. And then, He says something so astounding to Peter in the book of Matthew 16. Because Peter says, Jesus asked him, 
Who do people say I am? Well, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah, come down. And some say this and some say that. And Jesus says, who do you say I am? Who do you say? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, no one told you that except my Father who is in heaven. I didn't even tell you that. And therefore, the point of that, he goes on to say, because of that confession, because you knew that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, the principle of the body, the head, because of that confession, because of your trust in me, on this rock I will build my church and not even the gates of hell will prevail against that. Because of that, because you recognize you need me, not just on a Sunday, but on every single moment and second, second sickness, health, happiness, joy, wherever you are, you need me. And if you can catch that at your workplace, then you would be able to apply what we learn at church into your lives. Because you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And because I've confessed that on that statement of faith, Marius, Shane, Judy, all of you, on that rock I will build my church and you'll bring change to people at your workplaces. But, he is the head of this living organism. You are the church, or oh, SCLC, whatever, whoever there is. There is a group of people within all churches who is Christ's real church. And he is that head of that living organism that makes the church live and breathe. And so verse 18 of Colossians goes on to say, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be superior. So therefore you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the preeminent one of the body. You are the head. You are superior. Without you, we can just have tea and cake and talk about anything else. Because scripture would be meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. As Solomon says right at the end of the book of Proverbs. I think, I think it's Ecclesiastes. I have attained all knowledge. I've attained all wisdom. I've attained all riches. But what I actually find in life, that everything is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Solomon's saying, without the head, there's nothing worth living for. Without the head, where do your morals come from? If I can bring that story in to the picture. John 14, 6 says this, and you know, all know this. What does Jesus say? Repeat after me. I am the way, the truth and the life. Why did he say that? Because I am the way of the church, I am the truth of the church, and I'm the head, the life of the church. We think the church happened when at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came. No. The church happened when Jesus prepared the gospel with his disciples, and he brought him Therefore, let's get to the brunt of this morning. Let's get to the meat of this morning. I've given you this thing. Hold it. Keep that in your mind. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, He is the, your head. He is your living, life-breathing sustenance and source of Christianity. So what? The question to you all is what makes you, us, a Christian? So I've repeated a fundamental point from last week. But the question is, what makes you a Christian? Let me just go quickly. Don't go there. Let me go back to 1 Peter. I'll read it for you very quickly. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone. In fact, if you just say it's anyone and everyone. For the reason of hope. I've added in this now because I see so much of Colossians 1.27 coming in this. Can I read this for you again? Make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope. What does Colossians say? Christ in you is the hope of glory. All right? So I've added that into, into this section. So anyone, make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope, Christ in you, the hope of glory that is in you. 
So therefore, Colossians 1, 21, 23 says, If indeed you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope. What hope? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Don't shift from that hope. Believing in Jesus, family, I'm going to say this as gently as I can. And I'm going to back up everything that I'm saying this morning. And if there is disagreement, please let's sit down and talk. But I'm going to say something that is going to sound completely against most religious thought. And it's going to come across as absolutely outrageous. Believing in Jesus does not make you a Christian. I'm going to repeat that. Believing in Jesus does not make you a Christian. Now, concerning the two sections of Scripture that we have just read, one out of Colossians... One out of First Peter, that sounds to you absolutely outrageous. And by the way, you could blame me for being an, a, a heretic this morning. What is a heretic? It's a person that preaches falsities and doesn't uphold the word of God like it should. So you could blame me for that. But allow me to defend this, what I'm saying to you, so that you can walk out here and apply your belief practically to what you believe in. Believing in Jesus does not make you a Christian. Why am I saying that? If you believe in Henry Ford, does that make you a Ford motor car? No. Believing in Shakespeare, does that make you Romeo? No. <laughs> Believing in Shakespeare, does that make you Juliet? Yeah. It makes you none of those. It, 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 it's nonsensical because you believe in something doesn't automatically make you that unless of course you're a drama queen and you go and act as Juliet and you go and do a play and we'll say wow that's Juliet but Juliet comes off and now it's, it's someone else again but you, 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 you follow my thread you, you all follow this believing in something does not make you that I believe in a frying pan but it does not make me a poached egg it doesn't so the point is, just because someone says, and listen to me, church, I'm saying this gently. Just because someone says, I believe in Jesus, does not make them a Christian. Believing in all those other things. Henry Ford, Shakespeare. By the way, believing in Sh Shaka Zulu does not make you Nandi, who gave birth to his son. Doesn't make you that. So even though one confesses the name of Jesus does not necessarily make you a Christian. I'm going to back that up. The Bible tells us over and over and over. And I'll give you some scriptures. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be saved. Right? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. And... Um, Jesus says, blessed, blessed are, are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on and on and talking about salvation. But salvation and Christianity are mutually exclusive unless you make them work together. They're mutually exclusive. I might be saved, but I could be acting like the devil. I might be saying, I believe in God. But so do the Hindus believe in God. I can prove that to you. The Hindus have just made Jesus Christ another God. I challenge you, if you've got Hindus at work, go and ask them if they believe in Jesus. I'll tell you, yes, they do. Whatever reason they might give you, they, he might have been a good man, whatever. That's besides the reason. You don't want to argue that they believe in Jesus. Does that make them a Christian? So the word, if, if what I'm saying and I believe I, I am, what I'm saying is, hold some water. If what I'm saying, that believing in God does not necessarily make, or in Jesus or God, whatever, does not necessarily make you the Christian, then we have to actually look at what the Bible has to say, what does Christian mean? In order for you to understand what I'm saying. Because I've made an outrageous statement to you now, church. Something you probably have never heard before. Um, that's outrageous. So I have to back it up. What does the Bible say when it comes to Christian? By the way, the Bible uses Christian only twice in, in Scripture. 
not, nothing in the Old Testament, you will find it twice in the New Testament, the Greek word Christianos, Christian, will find twice in the Bible. Acts chapter 11, I want to go there. Acts chapter 11, verse 1 to 2, and then verses 21 to 26. Right? And then I'll break that down. And then I'll go to another passage. Acts 11, verse 1 to 2 says this. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles, those who aren't Jews, also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party or the Judeas, those, those, those Jews who thought, no, you have to live by the law. And the only way uh, um, you'll ever get to heaven is you must be circumcised and you must live by the law. So that completely shocked them that Gentiles... By the way, Gentile to them was a dog. How in the world are these Gentiles coming to Christ? Oh, through Peter. And they severely criticized him. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem to go and explain that three, four, five, six thousand Gentiles had just believed on the Lord and have come to salvation, these guys are mad. How dare you bring what you think is good news? That's bad news for us. Verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number, a massive number, who believed, turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem when he came and saw the grace of God. Sorry. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord. I'm going to skip right down to verse 26 when he had found him Barnabas went to look for Paul and he found him he brought him to Antioch for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians it's only the first time there's a second time you've ever found them in the Bible Christianos they were called Christians. Now the Bible is giving us a hint on why they were called Christians. We could have just stopped over there and said, Well, a great number of people came to the Lord. Praise God, they saved. But it goes on to say, to qualify, that these great number of people who came to the Lord were something more than just, oh, Well, I'm saved. So it says, In those days, they were called Christians. Now let's go to the second one. One Peter four. Verse one to six and then twelve to sixteen. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, and he has my brackets, for you or for us, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions but for the will of God for the time that it is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do living in sensuality passions drunkenness orgies drinking parties and lawless idolatry with respect to this they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you but they will give an account to him who is God, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel, listen, this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to you, to test you, as though something strange, that's verse 12, is happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of power and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. They are the key words. They're the keywords. Christian and ashamed. But let him glorify 
God in that name. How many times have we read in Scripture about giving honor and glory to God? About the fourth or fifth time now. Therefore, as a Christian, church, hear me, I'm going to say this humbly. As a Christian, I cannot go and do debauched things. I cannot as a Christian go and get fraught. I cannot as a Christian go down with my brothers and sisters, have a cup of coffee and start telling the most vilest jokes. Then I'm not a Christian. Why am I saying that? I've just read it. But if any of you suffers, and this word suffers can be for persecution because you might be sitting with me, Judy, and, and you don't want to tell those dirty jokes. You don't. But fault with your man. And as they say, say in English, you sour puss. By the way, puss is a cat. And I start persecuting you. Go, I'm, not, I'm not coming back to your eyes. You just do you sour. I'm talking about that kind of persecution. But if you suffer for that sake, Judy, as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but let him glorify in that name. What name? The name that is above all names. That name that you say you believe on, Daniel. So the reason for being called a Christian, what is the reason the Bible, why is the Bible using this word Christian twice, and only twice? What is the reason for it? For being a Christian, or being called a Christian? Let me put it another way. What is the reason that you and I refer to ourselves as Christians? And, that, and what should be the reason that we are actually called Christians, or call ourselves Christians? What is the reason? Verse 4 and 16 gives us a good clue. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, excessive indulgence, and sensual pleasure. That explains why you're a Christian. You are not joining them. You are sold out to the one who has called you. That's why you're a Christian. Anyone can say, I believe in God. And anyone can maybe even mean it. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does the Bible say? You will be saved. That's salvation, family. That's not Christianity. Christianity is an outflow of our salvation. Go into all the world, Matthew 28 says, and making disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've told you this over and over and over and again, but I want to tell you this again. Going into all the world, making disciple, the Greek idiomatic language means you be the disciple before you even open your mouth. Vais for Allah. Sorry, I'm not picking on you. I'll push out your coffee. Family, yummy. Why am I telling you all this? Because it's been nudging at my own heart. I'm transparent before you. I'm a sinner. But it's been tugging at my heart. Shane, Sunday after Sunday, you stand up here and you preach. Be the Christian. Now, I'm not saying that I'm going to get involved. I get involved in some debauched drinking party. I don't do that. But what's the difference again on a moral scale? from a debauched drinking party to telling some fat lie. Tell me. What's the difference? How do you know that? How do you know that? There's something inside of you. Morality tells you that. So Shane, lies aren't good enough also. So therefore, Shane, don't look upon anyone else in judgment. Live out your Christianity. So I've just spoken to Shane. Now I'm speaking to you. What makes you that Christian? Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. But the world looks at you, family, and they see disjointed, detached hypocrisy. And when I say you, please, I'm not, please, you in the plural. Here's the English terminology. You in the plural. Anyone. Huh? Well, let's talk about Jesus. Jy is a lichtback, a leonaar. Wat jy vir my sê, wat ek moet stop doen. You do it yourself. So therefore, 
according to biblical standards would you stand here and agree with me would you call yourself on that basis a Christian may I have an answer not gonna answer no but it goes on to say yet if anyone suffers as a Christian persecution and you've said near donkey they used to call me priest Doyle because they used to go and hang out in the bars and they didn't want to drink anymore I know some people in the church who, 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 who uh, in fact um, I'm not going to mention him he goes but his friends mock him his friends mock him he acts a coke and the people mock him listen my brother uh, you know who I'm talking to if you suffer as a Christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God right there in that situation right there so I can give you many, many, many reasons this morning, church, and we almost out of time. I'm telling you now we're going to be going over time a bit. This is important for you to hear. The practical application and also the, practical, the practicality of the sermon is to give you answers that you can use practically in your Christian lives. So if we go to this word, Christianos, Christian that's where we get it from as I said it's used twice in the New Testament what did they mean when they looked at Gerat or Nathan or any one of you and said ha ah, there's a Christian what did they mean there were two things they knew straight away two things and this is what it actually means they knew that you were a follower of Jesus Christ that's what it means the word Christian means a follower of Jesus Christ. If you follow someone, therefore you do what they do. That's basic, right? I was, I was an apprentice. I had a, um, what do you call him? I'll just call him a teacher, but there's another name for it. I had to listen to what he's doing. I had to follow him every single step of the way and do what he did. Second me meaning, these followers who were walking in the steps of Jesus Christ were always talking about him always these Greeks knew it these Greco Romans knew it whenever they saw these Christians in those days they were called Christians and as Peter says do not be ashamed when you suffer as a Christian when they saw you they would say yeah come the followers of Christ who cannot shut up about the glory of Christ they don't know how to stop speaking about him because everything about them is shining through them. And whenever we're in their presence, we're ashamed. That's Christian. That's what the Bible is telling us. By the way, that is the exact rendering of what Christian means. That's the exact rendering why they were so derogatory in calling them Christians. Because they were the Christ followers and the ones who could not stop spreading the message of Jesus Christ and talking about Him so much so that when we go back to the book of Acts, so much so when we go to um, all the other books, we find that scores and scores and scores of people came to the Lord because of why? Because of the followers of Christ who could not stop, stop talking about Him. But it went beyond that family. You can talk and talk until the cars come running home. But if there is no evidence about what you're talking about, then we're back to square one. Yea, as I lift back. But scores and scores of people came to Christ through these followers of Christ who could not stop speaking about Christ because evidence in their lives permeated out. It was just permeating. And that's why the Bible, we'll find out just now, says we should be living above reproach. We should be living in such a way that as Matthew 5 says, that those people who do not know God might glorify your Father who is in heaven. How do you glorify a God you don't know? You first have to submit yourself to that God. Therefore, you being a Christian, that follower of Christ, who is talking the truth about Christ in word and in deed, living before others, someone will ask you the question, why are you a Christian? And then we can go to Peter 3. Say so you can give them a reasonable defense of why you are a Christian. By the way, defense means a reasonable intelligent answer and at the same time it means a reasonable evidential answer why is this gray well let's get the shade card that's gray oh I see 
So I've given them an intelligent reason and I've given them an intelligent evidence. That's what defense means. It doesn't mean when someone comes to you and says, I don't believe in God. That's not defense. That's not. It's not when someone comes and attacks you for Christianity and says this and that and, and they revile you because Jesus says you will be reviled in my name. You don't hit them. That's not defense. This defense, yeah, this word means talking truth and showing truth. And when you do that, though they attack you, you are not ashamed of the one that you glorify. This is difficult. This is difficult. This challenges our religion. This challenges why we come to church. This challenges why we are called Christians. Not because I believe in Jesus. Happy, happy, happy. But we don't show anyone any evidence or give them a defense to say, Tinas, what is different about you? I want what you want and what you've got. Because your defense and your permeation is the power of Jesus shining through you. That's where he says give a defense. Be real. Get real. Don't warm the seats. Warm the world with the warm love of Jesus. I have people come into my shop and we talk. I'm not always the best evangelist, I've got to be honest with you. But church, this is, please don't put me on a pedestal, but I take opportunity on every single occasion, wherever the, the Holy Spirit leads me. If I see there's a moment, I'll talk to them about Jesus. I've sat with a young black woman who had a child and she's in drugs. I sat there and I cried with her and I prayed with her for her son because that's my way of preaching the truth about Jesus. And when I preach the truth about Jesus, it shows that I love her. Don't just say it, do it. That's why you're a Christian. Don't tell me and don't tell your suffering family who is in desperate need of Jesus that you believe in him. Because that's not the answer. The answer is in the book. Look to the book. And the answer is in the power by his Holy Spirit working in you. To give you wisdom for those that are hurting. Anyone can just say, you're going to hell. Anyone can say that. Why? Because the Bible says so. That's not the answer. The answer is be the disciple. The answer is be the Christian. Don't tell them you believe in Jesus. I can do that. I can have a quart of beer and we can all talk about Jesus. We can, it's, it's a lovely subject. But if I walk away and there's no hope left behind there, all I have been is a religious zealot. That's as good as it gets. Why are you a Christian? And if you can answer that, give yourself a reason for that. A reasonable answer to yourself. Is it because mommy sent you to Sunday school? Is it because your teacher made you go to assembly and sing, sing, sing Christian songs? Is it because we grew up that way? That does not make you a Christian in the old days, and you will recall this. Remember how we grew up, the older people over here? What was the first question they asked you when you went to school? This is how pathetic the world was. They asked you, what is your Christian name? Do you remember that? As if my name is just, I'm automatically a Christian. That's how we were brought up. Tradition. Your first name was meant to be a Christian name. Because everyone is going to heaven. So we sit with tradition. And we sit with truth. So in everything, at all times, be prepared continually all the time to make a defense for when you see a brother sinning you don't have to necessarily go and trap him out but make a defense before him with the good news of the gospel follow Jesus and never stop talking about Jesus never stop 
talking about him and when I say don't stop talking about him let your heart talk let your body talk let everything about you talk for those that are seeking answers because I tell you family the world is seeking an answer and they cannot find the answer in Christianity because Christianity is no different to Buddhism and no different to Islam and no different to Zoetarianism and no different to all the other isms because those almost gaan in kerk toe en ons hoor die deel doen my die preek en ek het vir julle voorheen gesê daar is koeksisters en koffie en ons gaan na huis toe en dis die einde van alles maar hy is die kop, hy is die hoof van die religaam van elk en ieder van julle every one of you he is the head and if he is the head he is your life he is your lifeline and therefore if he is your lifeline you will remember that you have been saved through him and you will remember where you come from that the book says not many of you have come from noble households I was poor when I grew up and I bet you a lot of you were poor I went to school sometimes with no shoes. The Bible says don't forget where you come from. Because just because you're a Christian does not make you better than anyone else. They need that hope that you have right now. Therefore, follow and talk as much as you can. That, my dear family, makes you a Christian. Yes, you're saved. But the Bible actually teaches somewhere that you would lose your crown. Yes, you might make it to heaven, but you would lose your crown. Because you never, and I never, lived and practiced what I preach. Why are you a Christian? Why? In those days, Especially in the days of Jesus, we had um, the Romans. And I think it was around about 30 or 40 years later, you know, you had Caesars and that. And these Romans, they would worship so many God. They were polytheists. They would worship um, Diana. They would worship whoever they could. But above all, their worship, Caesar was God. Caesar was God. And there was no one higher than Caesar. And you've got to understand that in this time when Jesus walked this earth as a human being, God incarnate, the God-man, he came into the world, as the Bible says, that at the right time when the world was desperately wicked, Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. So you've got to understand what type of world Jesus Christ walked into. He walked into a mixed grill, similar to our world today. And people had to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And the honor to Caesar that was his. So much so that you will recall who was in church, we spoke about image of God. The image of God, the Bible says, do not be conformed to the things of the world, but be conformed and transformed to the what? The image of God. Let the image of God be imprinted upon you. Not the Caesars of the world. Not those other things of the world. Not those things that draw you away. Let the image of God be conformed. But here in Luke 20, 24, Jesus asks his disciples, but they come to him and say, who must we pay taxes to? So Jesus says this, show me a denarius, which is, by the way, a day's wage. And he says, whose likeness, whose image is on that denarius? Whose image? Who's the one you pay homage to? And the answer was Caesar's. So before, in fact, Caesar eventually became a god in the Greco-Roman world. And all allegiance and all worship and all obedience was to be given to him and him alone. Now the problem, of course, is that according to Caesar and all his adherents, he alone was the one true God. And as I said, all allegiance and obedience was to be given to him. However, these people who were mentioned to us as Christians in Antioch, where you would be persecuted and maybe even killed, they were first called Christians. There's something different about these people. They obey the law of the land. 
they don't just only worship God but man oh man when I swear at him he loves me when I steal from him he loves me when I do all sorts of evil things against him he even gives me his coat you've got to understand that world you've got to understand that world you think we've got a rough in this country that was rough that was rough it was discrimination racism you name it all you put the whole thing in one pot that what was happening there so these who were first called Christians were worshiping another God which according to them despite the majority and also in the face of persecution it was Jesus the Christ the Son of the Living God who was the one and true God therefore their primary obedience and their primary worship was not to the Caesars of this world not to the things of this world but it was to Jesus Christ and Him alone how can that be? because I once was lost but now I'm found amazing grace amazing grace that's why I worship Him and if I worship Him I'm going to show the world I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe. Be the Christian's church. Be it. Those mensen by your werken, wat die here so nodig het, they need him. Instead of being the difference. You know, I heard a, another lady. Sorry, I, 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 need to, I need to bring this up. We were at your aunt's funeral. And I was sitting by a lady. And we got talking and she knows I'm a pastor. Yeah, and she told, told me about her Christianity. And it was so lovely. Until she told me about someone who wronged her and she wanted to give him a pia car. So now listen guys, I am Afrikaans. I was not Paul Kriya. Yeah. Well, pop club. We go one step further than pop club. What I'm saying, whether it's pop club, putu pop club, or the club, what are we saying? I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. But I have some pop club here. Pia ka, Paul Kreer. Why did I say that to you? I don't judge her immediately I think it about myself because by the way family I've done the very same thing the very same thing it got me thinking but Mark Owens, what are we doing are we just a bunch of religious fanatics who the pastor saying Leah still a Bible and bit Elke dag is that who we are oh my friend I'm not my Bible yes what can I now lees I'm busy now with Johannes maybe I'm going to Jacobus lees oh yeah I'm going to bed or are we the ones the followers in the steps of our Lord and Savior who cannot stop talking about him and the reason we can't stop talking about him is because his word brings life and everything in his word permeates through our lives Amen So if you're a follower of Christ, let me explain. I want to round this all up now, otherwise I can go on for another hour. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And so what does it mean to be someone who cannot shut up about the glory of Christ? What does that mean? So for those early Christians, they followed Jesus because there was evidence that he was the risen Lord. And some of them hadn't even seen him. I'm not just talking about the disciples. But they spoke in such a way that they, when they came across people, those people who came to the salvific power under Jesus knew exactly what Judy, what Marius, what Tinas, and what Erika, and Yay Steve, and, and all of you, Patricia, were saying is the truth. How do I know it's the truth? I can see it in you. Usamanga. Stop telling lies.
Acts 11, 20, 22. Don't go there. I'm going to read 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. There's the salvation. How do people come to salvation? There has to always be a group of genuine Christians. Not just yak, 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 yak. Jesus loves you. Everyone's going to heaven. I need to end. There's so much I've got to say, but I need to bring this to a close. Let's concentrate finally on those who are always talking about Christ. Remember I said there's two reasons. One reason was followers of Christ. And then there's the ones that are talking about Christ. You'll recall what we've just read in Acts 11, 26. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And there was another reason for this. And you need to know that the reason was a proverb, as I said. You know what they were saying in Antioch? And this is actually recorded. Oh, and I'm going to read this to you because I don't know it off by heart. In their Greek, I'm saying it in English. Oh, these are the people who are always talking about Christos, Jesus Christ, the Christ people, the Christians. Oh, here come the Christ followers. These are the people who are always talking about Christos, Jesus Christ. So there was an explicit reason that they were not ashamed of their Christ. Please note that they did not say, Oh, yuck come the people that believe in Jesus. They said, Yuck come the people who are always talking about Him. And we cannot understand how thousands and thousands of people are coming to Him. We don't have a cooking clue. But they're doing it. So they're followers. So family, I end with this. Christianity is not just talk. It's not just talk. If someone asks you, what church you go to tell them by all means? Someone asks you why you're a Christian, give a defense to them why you're a Christian. If it says, yes I am, and the conversation stops, then it stops. But if they ask you why you're a Christian, then as the book of 3, 50, Peter, 1 Peter 3.15 says, give a defense, an intelligible answer to them why you believe in Jesus, and then with evidence from your life, and I'm telling you, you've all got stories, but what God's done in your life. I know that. Start telling people what God has really done. Not subjectively. Oh, I, I just feel His love. But my God supplies my needs. My God has put me into a hospital when I should not be in a hospital, Caroline. My God has done this. You've all got the stories. There's your defense. Do not be ashamed. And I say this in the most strictest of terms. Then go home and call yourself a Christian. I have not judged you, family. By no means have I judged you this morning. If anyone is to be judged, this is the man to be judged. But I'm saying, take what we have been studying for the tenth week now and put it into practice. Go to your schools, go to your workplace, and give them a reason, not for the season, but for the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's pray. Father, yes, we believe. We, we believe. And I know so many people seated here this morning, they believe. They have come to the knowledge of the salvation of the one and only true God, Jesus Christ, who is able to save. And I know there are people here seated here that have laid their sins at your feet, at your cross, and have asked you for forgiveness. And Lord, you have been ready to save. But Father, there are many who are sitting on the gravy train of salvation, just telling the world I'm under construction, but the world just sees an ugly construction, but they do not see the temple that's being constructed, Lord. Help us. Help us. Help us. Lord, help us. A family, they want answers. Our friends, they want answers. Father, the only reasonable answer come, that can come is by your Holy Spirit, because greater is He that is in me than in He and He that is in the world. So give us the wisdom 
But Father, let us not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ that leads men and women to salvation so that they for, therefore may become disciples of nations. In Jesus' name, amen.